إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما We begin by thanking and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high we thank Him in abundance, we seek His forgiveness, we seek refuge in Him from the evil within ourselves and from the evil consequences of our bad actions. We bear witness that there is absolutely no one worthy of worship except Him alone. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him, is the last and final messenger of Allah. It's very important that we renew our consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First and foremost, on this blessed day of Friday in this blessed gathering of Jumu'ah, that we remind one another that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware, is fully aware of everything that we do and say and think of at all times. And developing that consciousness is what will lead to closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A closeness that we all need. A closeness that many of us don't know yet that we need. But might be searching for that missing aspect of our life. What's interesting about closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, taught us in an authentic prophetic narration when he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu min rabbihi wa huwa sajid. Our beloved Messenger Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said that the closest that a person will be to their Lord and Master and Creator is when they are prostrating, when they are in this position known as sujood, when they are physically in the lowest position that their body can be in, when the head is literally touching the ground. A position that when you see and you look at someone in that position from afar, it seems like a position of humility of humiliation. It seems nonsensical. Why when God created you standing upright with a spine and with your head on the top of your body, do you voluntarily go ahead and put that head of yours on the same place where everyone walks? And the reason why is because it is closeness to your master and your Lord and your creator. When we talk about Human beings, we walk upright. But when you talk about the one who created you from nothing, and the one who after we die, we will return to, then when He commanded us to prostrate in that physically lowest position, it is in that position that we actually find height and honor and glory. It is by way of humility in front of our Lord and Creator that we find strength, honor and glory. And what's interesting about this position, the word that it is used to refer to this position is sujood. And we are blessed and honored to have with us a group of distinguished students that are spending the summer learning the Arabic language. So perhaps we take a few minutes analyzing this word and thinking of another word that shares a common denominator, sujood, which comes from the root of sajada. You know another word that shares that root? What is this place called? This place is called a masjid. Now if you don't know any Arabic, do you hear any similarities there between sujood and masjid? Absolutely. 
Because they share that common denominator of sajada. Why is a masjid called a masjid? Because first and foremost, it's a place where people gather and literally are prostrating, as we will be doing in a few minutes when we conclude the sermon and pray the salat. A place of sujood. Now, of course, you can make sujood and pray anywhere in the world. And linguistically speaking, any place that you make sujood in, that you prostrate on, linguistically can be referred to as a masjid. But technically speaking, we were referring to these structures, these buildings, these places of worship, these houses of Allah. The houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where people gather to remember Him. As we mentioned in a previous sermon many weeks ago, when that Bedouin who was new to Islam and new to the idea of a masjid came and actually urinated inside the masjid. And the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, in his mercy, in a very calm state, simply told him that these places, these masajid are for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for relieving oneself where others might need a place to pray. So this is the masjid, a place where we congregate for prayer. And it's a reminder about the value of coming together, a reminder about unity, a reminder about congregation. The Prophet ﷺ told us that making the prayer in congregation, Salatul Jama'ah, the prayer, the making the Salat in congregation is better, is khair than Salatul Fadh, than when a person prays by themselves, bi khamsin wa ishreena daraja, or in another narration, bi sab'in wa ishreena daraja. 25 or 27 times better to do it in congregation than to do it by yourself. Why? Because the whole idea is that we come together, that we stand in these straight rows, and that we understand that we are all praying towards the same Creator, in the same direction. And that not only builds unity, but it also builds equality and equity. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ That these masajid belong to Allah. These houses of worship don't belong to me. They don't belong to you. They don't belong to any other imam. They don't belong to the board. They don't belong to the donors. These masajid are the houses of Allah. And they are open for everyone to come and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. And when we look at this story and the, the history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find that his masjid was a living practical example of that. So you find the value that the Prophet ﷺ placed in these houses of worship. So much so that Rasulullah ﷺ taught us that من بنى لله مسجدا بنى الله له بيتا في الجنة A prophetic narration that unfortunately our ears shut off when they hear it because we think we are in a masjid fundraiser. Don't worry, this is not a masjid fundraiser. This is a reminder. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever builds a house for Allah then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build a house for him in Jannah, in paradise. Essentially guaranteeing that this person will have a route, a path, a secured destination in Jannah. That shows you the value of these places of worship, these places of remembrance and of congregation. When we look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was finally able to escape the persecution in Mecca and migrate with his few companions to Medina, before even entering the city, they established a masjid. The first masjid, known as Masjid Quba, in the south side of the city of Medina. And then they continued and entered the actual city of Medina. And again, what does Rasulullah do? By no surprise, he again establishes a masjid. It was not as luxurious or as comfortable as this one here. Thankfully, alhamdulillah, we have these luxuries and we should be thankful for them. But it was a house dedicated for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only in ritual acts of worship, like what we are partaking in today, but also in other general voluntary acts of worship, like education. The Prophet sallallahu his main place of education, the main place of learning for the early generations of Islam and all throughout the history of Islam until today is the masjid. And on that note, that's why we have programs like the summer intensive program which actually begins tomorrow. A program dedicated to understanding a particular section of the Qur'an, of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More about that to come later. But a place for education, a place for social reform, 
A place for those who have nothing to find something very valuable. As we know, there was Ahl al-Sufa, the people who had nothing except the shirts on their backs because they migrated from Mecca and all of their wealth was taken from them. They had a place in the masjid. There was no distinction based on socio-economic status. When we line up for prayer, you don't pause and say, um, <clears throat> yeah, you got to get in the row behind. We're not on the same level. That does not happen. And that's unacceptable. There's no room for racial lines in the masjid. And that's a, very, that's a very pertinent point to remember, especially in light of all of what is happening in this very country of ours. When we think that supposedly racism had been extinguished hundreds of years ago, but it was not. And it's still ripe and rampant and has been. And the only reason why it's becoming more a point of talking now is because of the advent of technology, thankfully, People are capturing all of these instances of police brutality, specifically upon African Americans in this country. And so we know about it, and so we're talking about it. But it's been going on for a very long time. And it's appalling and it's unacceptable. When you hear stories of a police officer firing more than 120 rounds onto two people inside of a car, and then jumping on top of the hood and firing another 41 rounds and claiming that that's for safety. If you're really trying to protect yourself, you don't jump on top of the hood of the car. And you don't need safety by firing 140 rounds. That's called racism. And Islam does not accept that. Not only is that unacceptable in this masjid, in this house of worship, but in this system of religion of ours, in this way that we obey Allah, our Creator, that is absolutely unacceptable and not allowed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُومُوا لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بالقسط. Stand up for justice. And by the way, it's very important for us as Muslims. Specifically, I would like to address those of us here that are either immigrants or children of immigrants in this community. That we do not underestimate the struggle of black Americans and African Americans in this country. And think that we're independent of that. Because we don't even know, we, don't, we haven't even realized how much of a blessing it is that we have to practice our religion because of the struggle that Africans and African Americans were going through in this country decades before any of us even got off the boat or our parents did or our grandparents. One of my teachers and mentors who's a very elderly man, African American, came to Islam way before I was born, way before my parents came to this country. And he was telling us and he would ask some of the brothers from different cities, New York, Chicago, Toronto, here in LA, what's going on on such and such street corner? And they would say, oh, you know, there's a masjid over there. What's going on on such and such boulevard? Oh, you know, all the Muslims have their shops over there. Oh, really? That's interesting. You know, back in the 60s, we used to give da'wah on those streets. There wasn't a single Muslim to be seen in those days. And now these street corners are filled with people that have emigrated from different Muslim countries. And we think we're the ones that established Islam here. And we think we're the saviors of Islam in this country, or the saviors of diversity or justice. Absolutely not. That had been going on a long time before. And this is a sensitive topic, but an important one. Because right here in our masajid, we have some subconscious ideas and feelings that we need to extinguish and get rid of once and for all. You know why? Because Rasulullah described them best. Nothing that I could say about racism is better than what the Messenger of Allah said. He said, it's natina. You know what that word means in Arabic? It means repulsive. It means disgusting. If you pass by a sewage area and you can't even breathe and you feel like you're going to get a headache from the bad smell, that's natin, afan. And that's what racism is. When the Prophet ﷺ overheard one man refer to another man in a negative way because his parents were black, he told him, Inna kamru'un fika jahiliya. You're an ignorant man. You have ignorance within you. Because that's disgusting. And so while all of that is going on right now around us, we come and we gather in these houses, and this is one of the few places where we can be a beacon of extinguishing racism in our community and in this country. And we have to stand for that. And that is an important reminder. So that's what these masajid stand for. They stand for equality, education, help, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And we need to really think deeply about what the role of these masajid are in our lives. It's not simply a place for us to come and do rituals and leave. It's not simply a place for us to experience the spiritual high of Ramadan and then be absent for 11 months. One of the reasons why we love Ramadan so much and it gives us that energy is because of the crowd. The energy of the crowd. It's a strong vibe. You know, they say we're vibing. That's the vibe you get in Ramadan. Because everyone is here praising and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, coming together, getting to know one another. To get to know one another. People come to the masjid and are not giving salam. Give salam. Afshu salam abaynakum. So understanding the role that this masjid plays, not only in our lives, but in the lives of your children. Don't just come to the masjid. Bring your families with you to the masjid. No one should be left behind. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تمنعوا إماء الله مساجد الله. The Prophet ﷺ categorically said, do not forbid the women from coming to the houses of Allah. Because this isn't a men's masjid. This isn't a women's masjid. This isn't any one masjid for anyone. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Allah concludes that verse with a reminder of what this is all about. This is all about turning to our Creator and in obedience as He commanded us to do, worshipping none other but Him. That is the foundation of this religion. That's why we establish these houses of worship and of remembrance, of social reform, of help, of justice. And that's why we need to fill them. إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ We need to build them and we need to fill them with our involvement, with our participation and with our support. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ وَنَفَعَنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِمَا فِيهِ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ وَالذِّكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ أَقُولُ مَا تَسْمَعُونَ وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِن كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Return and repent back to your Lord, for He is the most merciful, most forgiving. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا As we mentioned that one of the main objectives of this masjid is that it is a place for education and for that reason I want to remind you all of the program that begins tomorrow a program that is designed to happen just after the month of Ramadan a month where we strive to come closer to the words of Allah in the Qur'an. And that's why we have this program designed specifically for those that have work or summer school or other engagements to come on Monday and Wednesday evenings and on Saturday mornings for three-hour sessions to sit in the company of their fellow students, brothers and sisters and to listen to a diverse body of scholars and speakers from different parts of the country and locality, men and women, to teach us about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this particular portion of the Qur'an, the 23rd juz, covering the surahs of Yasin, As-Safat and Sa'd. And that begins tomorrow, inshaAllah ta'ala, at 10 a.m. If you have not registered, I strongly and highly encourage you to do so. And if you are not able to physically be here for the classes, we are also offering the program by way of live streaming. So you can attend the program through the internet from the comfort of your home or wherever else you might be. Also, don't forget that we do have a Hajj package program going from this masjid with myself and Sheikh Muhammad Faqih. And there are less than 10 seats available in the program. And there are a few seats that are pending. So it is encouraged for you to hasten and reserve your spot if you have the means and you have not already fulfilled this pillar of Islam. Or if you might happen to know someone that is in that position, please remind and encourage them and put them in contact with us so we can have them with us in our group. Also, a reminder that tonight we will have the FFN program. We'll be resuming as we took a break for the month of Ramadan. And tonight is an especially interesting program because it is going to be a, uh, having a panel of brothers and sisters that are relatively new to Islam. And they are going to be talking about their experiences in this Ramadan. Many of us were born in families or households that have been practicing Islam. And so Ramadan was just a normal annual part of our lives. But many of our brothers and sisters, this is a new thing for them. So it would be very important for us to listen to their experiences, to show empathy, to understand their struggles, so we can be supportive for them and the others that will come after them, inshaAllah ta'ala. Also beginning tomorrow at 1.30 after Dhuhr, 
is going to be a meeting for the group of wives, the uh, senior uh, group for this masjid, those that are above the age of 50. They are going to be meeting tomorrow. There are going to be flyers with more information passed out outside. As you continue attending today's program, remember that the value of the masjid is high and that the masjid has etiquettes. And of the most basic etiquettes that we should show towards this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is cleanliness. Not only in ourselves when we come to the masjid, but making sure that we leave the masjid behind as clean. It's unfortunate to hear of how some people behave carelessly in the restrooms or in other parts of the masjid. And we know that none of us would behave that way in our homes. Or if we do happen to behave that way in our homes, then it's inappropriate for us to behave that way in the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us of those who build and fill the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us of those who qulubuhum mu'allaqa bil masajid. May Allah make us of those whose hearts are attached to the masjid. Because those are the ones who will have the shade of Allah's throne when there will be no shade except His shade. May Allah grant us that shade on that difficult day of judgment. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. We beg Allah to give us the best in this life and the best in the hereafter and to protect us from the torment of the hellfire. عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم الجليل يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه وآلائه يزدكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقيم الصلاة